Thanks, Wayne. And uh, that was fascinating. I'm really uh, glad we were able to get through questions there too. So that uh, I think your talk, which really, uh, your, your talks, which were really aspirational and moving the field forward are a nice segue to um, the people who arguably care most about the treatments that are coming. Uh, so I'll open just by introducing myself. I'm Ann Paduri. I'm a neurologist and researcher at Boston Children's Hospital. And I'm really uh, honored that Keith asked me to moderate this next session. Uh, we have a task that's uh, pretty heavy, and I think as heavy as the science, which is to talk about the experience of people who are actually experiencing grin disorders. So what we'll do for this next uh, 45, 50 minutes or so is to hear from a couple of individuals who are personally affected in their families by the grin disorders, and then we'll have some question and answers uh, uh, time for all of you to ask questions. If, if you don't ask questions, I'll come up with some, but I would much prefer to have uh, audience participation and we'll, we'll monitor the, the chat as well. So without further ado, if we can, I don't know if we can spotlight our first speaker. Okay. So my daughter and my husband actually were diagnosed with GRIA 2. I, I had to put this picture here because it's for comic relief. This one with her tongue out, it's just great. Um, and so go here. Um, this is their specific mu mutation. Um, my husband is not apparently mu uh, mosaic. He apparently has it as well. Um, and I'll explain his symptoms and everything. Um, but I don't want to forget. Um, I need to thank a few people. My husband, Matt, obviously, because he's letting me present the stuff, some of which is his own medical information. And because he has just been an amazing husband. He has, you know, parenting a, a sick kid is really hard and he has stepped up and, you know, he lets me have my days where I need to sleep in and he doesn't complain. Um, she was born with a heart defect. And so I need to thank the University of Maryland heart team for patching her up. Um, Kennedy Krieger for getting us to a diagnosis and all the treatment. I, I need to thank Kiergren because you guys have given me an outlet and support and a way to feel useful. Um, and I need to thank researchers because there's already been some researchers that have reached out to me and have talked to me and everything and, and they didn't have to do that and it means a lot. So <clears throat> this is their specific mutation. Um, I actually do not know what that means, um, but apparently it's supposed to affect the splicing. Um, and so we'll start with my husband's symptoms. He, he was diagnosed with Asperger's um, in 1990, and his mom has described what I believe are ocular gyric crisis, where his eyes would just go back in back of his head when he was three. And that never, um, thankfully that never came back. Um, they thought he might've been having seizures around that time, but he had a normal EEG. Um, he didn't walk until he was two. Um, constipation was a big issue for him then, and it still is now, and it's an issue for Abby too. Um, and like I said, it, it doesn't indicate he's mosaic on the West report, and he lives a full life. He works, he drives, and as you can see, he's got a beautiful daughter that loves him very much. Um, so Abby was born with um, two holes in her heart, which were repaired at seven weeks old. Um, she did develop a post-operative arrhythmia, and they gave her some medicines for that. And she is currently weaning off the very last one a year later. Um, I, I should mention that she's now 16 months old. Um, she's had severe reflux from the get-go. Um, Prevacid has helped a lot with it. Um, for a while, we really didn't see it at all from about eight months old to a year old. And it has slowly come back a little bit for some reason, even on the Prevacid, we've upped the dose and it's still not, you know, she still has some reflux. Um, she has a global delay. She's at about three to six months in most skills, so she can sit in a high chair, but not quite independently yet. If you, you put her in tripod, she'll stay there for up to a minute sometimes. Um, she's had a lot of blood work, high calcium. It's right on the borderline pretty much every time, and her B12 is actually really, really high. Um, they tested that twice because they weren't sure it was, you know, if it was a lab error or not. Um, we have her in a stander and 
most recent is that we've actually started grabbing objects finally, which has meant so much to me. She had a re regression at six months old and she, she had been grabbing objects up until then, just a little bit. And then she stopped completely until she was about a year old and then has slowly started again, which that and the fact that the eye contact has come back is just amazing. Cause I remember one day in October of last year, just crying and just begging God. I was like, all I wanna do is make eye contact with my daughter and have her grab stuff. And you know, I can make eye contact with her at times. It's not, I don't think it's, you know, at a normal level for a typical child, but it's, you know, better than it, it had been during the regression. Um, she only eats purees. Um, she, she basically developed pretty normally for a six month old that had had heart surgery up until six months. And then we just kind of plateaued. Um, and she gets frequent colds. Um, she just came out of the hospital two weeks ago for having two um, at the same time. Um, and they don't know if that's because of the hypotonia or if it's because they have to resect the thymus when um, they patch the holes in the heart or, or what, but she constantly gets colds and it, you know they can be serious in her time. She's been hospitalized twice, once for, for, for colds, once for RSV and once for two regular colds at once. Um, this is a picture of her before the regression um, where she would actually mimic faces. I don't, I don't see her. Um, she'll smile. She'll mimic a smile, but she won't. This was me pretending to eat her <laughs> and she would pretend to chomp back and it was so funny. And uh, I miss these days. Um, thankfully, we got some of the interaction back. Um, some more playful faces. She's about six months there. Um, she's currently on propanolol and, and weaning off of it. Uh, she gets another heart study in a few weeks, and if that's good, then she'll stay off of it. Um, she had been on digoxin up until December, and she'd been on amiodarone um, from December of, well, from January of 2021 to April of 2021. That was all for her heart. Um, she also takes Prevacid, um, Gastrops, and a laxative. Um, the biggest questions I have in this is, is you know, why are they so much more severe than Matt's? Um, one researcher told me there was a technique to compare their RNA somehow, um, because I guess the splicing is the problem. And so it might be that the, the spliced stuff is messed up. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm you know, not a doctor. I don't know what I'm saying, but. <laughs> um, and then she did have DNHD1. She got two variants in that. Um, which is another gene that people know a lot less about that than they do um, the GRI genes, apparently. Um, I did have a researcher look into it. Uh, he was so kind. And, and he said that he does not believe that that's what's contributing to it because um, he, did, he, he did some research and that's, that's what he came to the conclusion of. I, I don't know. Um, you know, I wonder if some of the medications she's on are helping or hindering her. I know, I know that some of these heart meds can have CNS effects. Um, and so, you know, I've always wondered if, if that why, cause she, you know, she seemed mostly on track until six months. Um, my husband takes um, a antidepressant, Prozac. And um, there's apparently papers linking that to Gria um, that it helps it. And it certainly helped him a lot. He said, he's been on it for almost 20 years. Um, so I don't know, maybe, maybe, you know, that's why he's doing better. I, you know, we just don't know. Um, and does the high B12 and calcium have anything to do with, I mean, we don't know why she has that. And why did she regress? Those are kind of the things that I don't know. So those are my biggest questions with it. Um, and that's kind of, I, I guess I should talk about what, what life is like right now. Um, it's, it's like having a six month old that's, you know, in a, 16 month old body and it's hard. Um, she's heavy and she, you know, she, she can't even sit independently yet. Um, it's sad to see all the, the other kids in her regular daycare that are, you know, developing milestones and she's not meeting them. We're gonna put her into a special needs daycare um, as soon as the slot open up. Um, but, but this Cure Grin group has been so, 
such a lifeline for me. I'm, I mean, literally a lifeline because I was in a really dark place before, you know, be, until we had a diagnosis until, you know, until I had hope again. So, um, yeah, I, I guess that's really it. Um, you have any questions? I think there's one, there's a question uh, in the Q and A. Um, that's a very specific one. Huh, no, you can, uh, just about nitrate or, nit nitrate or nit nitrate or nitrite levels measured. I'm kind of curious as to why, you know, what the purpose of that would be, what, what that would show us. Um, but no, she's never had that measured. She's had lots of things measured, but not that. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your story. And I, you know, you can hear the the highs and the lows and, and everything you've gone through. You've summarized so beautifully for us in, in a short time. So I, I really appreciate that. And, and I'll say, you know, as a physician who sees patients with a number of different neurodevelopmental disorders, um, and we, we're so focused on the medicine in those half hour visits, we don't even always get to get this richness of, of history and the pictures and what life is like. And, and for the researchers in the lab, you know, to have this opportunity to hear from you uh, is, is tremendous to be able to really hear what, what it's been like for you and also to give some purpose to, to the work that we do in our lab. So Kat, I'll thank you very much for, for presenting and we'll hear next from Allison and then we'll have hopefully a, a lively discussion. Hi, everybody. Um, can you see my screen? We can, yes, thank you. Okay, great. Um, so we come from the UK. Uh, this is my son, Evan. Um, he's 12 now. He turns, well, he's tw actually, he turns 12 now, in a few months time. So I shouldn't wish the months away, but yeah, 11 for the moment. This is his genetic mutation. His is completely de novo. I don't understand the rest of it, but um, for those of you who understand, then that's his mutation. I think he is the only one with it. He has grown one, obviously. Um, so uh, I'm just going to talk a little bit to you. I'm sorry if you've already seen this presentation because I did give it to a couple of the researchers already. So I apologize if um, you've already seen it. But this is a little bit about our journey. He was, he was born with seizures at birth. They didn't really think it was anything wrong in the beginning. They kept telling us it was like early baby movements and there was nothing wrong until uh, um, he was seen on discharge at the hospital after kind of two days. And they were like, oh, actually that's a seizure. Best we take you straight into the NICU. So then we went straight into ICU and spent the first few months in hospital. He, in the early years, had a lot of feeding issues and bronchitis. He had a G-tube fitted at the age of one. He's had extensive and very inconclusive testing, mostly. Um, it kind of the tests just go on and on and we're now at the point where we're kind of developing completely unique tests which aren't used for other children and in the country as far as we can work out to kind of get to the bottom of his current breathing problems so testing is always a challenge and very repetitive <laughs> he was has been you know very slow to develop he sat on his second birthday um, and he kind of started walking independently probably not in well he also regressed he walked independently for about a month or two and then um regressed and now won't walk really independently beyond a couple of steps but that was at about when he was about eight um we were lucky we had early support so we were lucky we are fortunate to have kind of a system which picked us up and I think because he's at the severe end of the scale we we did get that support early on from the NHS um uh, in the beginning, we had kind of individual negative gene tests. They tested for rets. They tested for a few things. And particularly because I was pregnant at the time, they wanted to try and work out what it was. But it wasn't until he was eight that we got our diagnosis of GRIN1 through the developmental deciphering developmental delay study, which happened um, through the Sanger Center Institute in Cambridge. Um, but that kind of took four years to get that um, that diagnosis and at the time we were kind of crying out for information because he had started this autonomic breathing disorder so we were just really grateful to be put in touch with kind of the grin community at the time which has obviously since grown into the very strong cure grin that it is now so these are um his some of his symptoms <laughs> it's quite a lot you can see 
He um, has severe global developmental delay and profound and multiple learning difficulties. He's developed this autonomic breathing disorder um, where he cycles through um, periods all day long. It doesn't happen in the night, it only happens in the day. He cycles all day long kind of through um, apneas where he stops breathing, where he then turns blue. Then he his brain kicks in and he starts breathing and then he hyperventilates to kind of like recover and that cycles pretty much all day long, varying. Sometimes it happens really very frequently, like every few minutes, and then sometimes it's longer. You can have like two or three in an hour. Um, but he has become very accustomed to kind of coping with not breathing, um, strangely, but that's what he has managed to do. Um, he has uh, he's had seizures since birth and continues to have them, although they are pretty well controlled at the moment, and they're not by far his biggest concern at the moment is his breathing. He has temporal lobe sclerosis, which we're not sure where that comes from, um, whether it was a big seizure that he had when he was a baby or whether it comes from when he has lots of feeding and swallowing difficulties. He's got an open insertion gastrostomy, a lot of reflux and vomiting, um, similar to the, the person who spoke uh, before us lots of kind of gastric problems and these cycles of kind of weight loss and weight gain. Mark, he definitely, the sturdier he got, the, the easier it felt that he was not so kind of fragile. Oh, it says my internet connection is unstable. I hope people can hear me. He has lots of sleep issues. Cortical visual impairment obviously is a, is a key factor of um, Bryn 1, uh, and he's certified partially sighted. Got lots of um, different issues within his vision as well. He continually is moving and rocking and thrashing and uh, just doesn't, doesn't ever stop moving. He's completely... Um, Nonverbal, but very loud. Uh, he is able to communicate things, happiness and sadness and that kind of thing. But beyond that, struggles. Uh, lots of kind of self-harm behaviours where he's biting his hands. We have, he has squashy finger syndrome, which we call it. Um, and he has these autonomic episodes, which um, make him very kind of like hot and red and blotchy in his, in his face and his skin. And then his sister calls it his alien legs where he gets like a weird blotchy alien pattern down his legs. <laughs> That's what his little sister calls it. Um, so we're lucky we get a lot of um, services and support from his, uh, he's in special needs school, a local community school where everything's integrated into the curriculum. And then he has individual personalized um, sessions for hydro and rebound, which is um, trampolining and music and uh, intensive interaction. We have a good team around us from the NHS. It's not always joined up. We do struggle with that in the UK that sometimes we're not speaking the same language within teams, but one of our consultants is, is doing a good job at trying to pull it all together. Um, we've got, yeah, lots of kind of nurses and dietitians and physios and a lot of support around that. So we're, um, we are lucky. We're really lucky to have um, fam family who help a lot. Um, grandma is one of those super grandma fundraisers who's been a godsend at helping us with Evan. Uh, and we are lucky to have great carers which come into the home as well and um, charities, local charities, which provide support. And Kiwagrin obviously is great for kind of information. And it's lovely to have met lots of the other parents in the UK. We had a get together and that was really good. Um, these are some of the drugs past and present that he's on um, and has been on. Um, he's recently come off sertraline, which I think is an, uh, some kind of like antidepressant as well. Um, that was supposed to help his breathing, but it didn't really. Um, and he's been struggling since he's come off that with kind of lots of other um, issues, but the acetazolamide really, really helps with his breathing. Um, the melatonin helps keep him asleep or get him to sleep. Um, the oxygen is is good to have as kind of like a rescue, but um, doesn't really provide a massive amount of um, improvement, to be honest with you. Uh, um, 
um, stuff for his um, tummy. And paracetamol we've kind of introduced as a regular um, uh, daily thing because of the red blotchy skin is we think is quite painful for him. So that helps him with pain. Um, so our life is, um, yeah, kind of hectic and a bit crazy. Um, he is very determined, has a really infectious laugh and loves giving cuddles. He loves physical contact. He will grab hold of anybody and give anybody a cuddle at any point in the day. He's extremely physical, partly mobile. He kind of crawls around, bunny hops around. We call it his gorilla hop. Um, he's extremely loud. He's got a very loud voice to be heard. He can be very happy one minute and then very sad the next. But And he's constantly on the move in his own little world. He's kind of oblivious to what goes on, but he is happy in his own little world. Um, yeah, we get we get good support. We are not always believed and listened to pro professionals, which can be frustrating. It took six months to somebody to, including my own husband, I must admit, um, for people to believe that he was like not breathing, that he was turning blue and having these episodes of cyanosis before we went into hospital and they were like, oh, yes his oxygen's dropping to 40 percent oh and there it comes back up and then it drops again so that was quite um frustrating but now that people realize that it happens um it's good uh yeah and we kind of juggle three time full-time jobs we both work full-time me and my husband and then evan is a full-time job in himself um but we like to try and get on with things as crazy as it is sorry that's my cat meowing in the background i hope you can't hear him and then the future. So we try not to plan our life over the last 11 years has taught us not to plan anything. Um, but we hope for a cure and we hope for effective treatments and we hope for uh, improved quality of life for Evan. We want him to have greater, but I think we recognize that he'll probably have limited independence. Uh, improved communication would be uh, like a milestone in his life. I think that he could tell us what he wants when he wants it. Um, and we like to travel and have fun. That's us and Evan in different places uh, all over the world. So we don't, we try not to let it act, you know, stop us, but it does. But we try to kind of, I'm a bit dogged. We will do this. It doesn't matter <laughs> kind of way. And um, who knows, this is something that grandma got Evan involved in. He potentially... Oh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do it because let me just see if I can play it. Oh, no, you can't see it. That's Evan. And he's never does anything completely independently. And then the surf instructor just let go of him and he just caught a wave in and off he goes. So that was pretty incredible. That's probably the first independent thing he's completely ever done. <laughs> so yeah, who knows? <laughs> uh, and oh, no, thank you. That's me. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Alison. That was great. Uh, and we could see the video. That was really cute. Okay. So, really <laughs> nice to see him there in the ocean, enjoying it. Um, so we have uh, a couple of questions coming in that I, I definitely want to get to, um, and uh, I think uh, and a comment love the surfing from Keith, which I agree with. Um, <laughs> That's it too. Maybe, yeah, he maybe got, I'll just. Yeah. Um, he got his G tube at one, so when he was um, up to that point, he was having a lot of um, pneumonias, aspiration pneumonias. And then they wanted to do a fundo, but we pushed against it because he is fed. He had the G tube at once and um, we wanted him to just eat normally. Like I was really like, I felt like I would be a failure as a parent if I couldn't feed my child like food. So I was really like, no, we're not having a fundo. We didn't have one. And, you know, maybe it was the wrong decision, but he, he, he now has two gastric feeds a day and three meals so he eats breakfast lunch and, and supper so he continues to eat which has been really I think important for, for me and for him he loves to eat he really loves to eat um yeah so it was yeah at one he has him great 
Well, I have a couple of questions. I thought it would be, um, particularly since you're in very different healthcare settings, I thought it'd be great to hear from each of you, uh, Kat and Allison, on, on the medical front. You know, do, do you feel like your children have a medical home? Is there a central place uh, where things are coordinated or does that all fall on you? And I, I guess I probably can anticipate the answer, but uh, would just be interested to hear what you think about that and, and and what things the medical system might do to improve if it's not serving the coordination needs. Do you want to start, Allison, and then we'll ask Kat as well? Um, I think, I mean, I think it is you as a parent because you're the person who brings everything together. We, in the UK, we have a community, or we, like us as a family, have a community paediatrician who's pretty good at bringing, every, like, bringing things together in terms of the other um specialists so like the neurologist and the respiratory consultant and all that kind of stuff but i think in terms of like collect like everything in terms of physio and all the rest of it there's a lot of that kind of falls down um and it and it ends on your shoulders um however well or not in my case you do that as a parent <laughs> Um, yeah, I, it is. It does fall on you, I think, mostly. Kat, how about you? Um, she's she's finally getting a home. Um, I, I I would say yes now, finally. Um, Kennedy Krieger um, is our local hospital, and they um, they they're you know they're pretty famous for neurology and everything, and they um, they actually have a fairly new synaptopathies clinic. <laughs> and their doctor um, there has been just amazing. She's willing to, you know, if I send her a research paper, she'll look at it and she'll she'll talk to people. It's it's great. Um, and and she finally lets me talk about, you know, I can ask her about general health concerns rather than just neurology. Like, um, and, and and so she doesn't. There was a problem for a while where the heart people only wanted to talk about the heart, and the pediatrician only wanted to talk about like if she had a cold. And the neurologist only wanted to talk about the brain, but um, finally, um, I, I think she has a holistic level of care at this one clinic in Kennedy Krieger. Um, I think a lot of people don't have that, and I think that it's it's hard to find it. Um, they they joked with us at Kennedy Krieger. One, one of the clinics was like, "Yeah, you're just doing like uh, clinic ping pong." And, yeah, kind of were for a while, but. Because they sent first, they put her in the muscular dystrophy clinic, not muscular dystrophy, um, cerebral palsy, and then they put her in um, an infant follow-up clinic because at first, you know, they thought that it was delays because of her heart stuff, and then it was genetics, and then it was autism, and and finally, you know, she's where she needs to be. I think so. It, it took a while, but yep, she's there finally. You so do definitely need. You do definitely need specialists that are willing to look beyond their specialism though you like like you said Indeed. having like a neurologist that only looks at the brain is is um really difficult i find really frustrating and i find i think yeah for us at least neurology is is that is that speciality that does that our respiratory is better because obviously his respiratory problems come from the brain so they're more like uh um understanding of kind of like everything and treating everything rather than just treating his lungs because actually his lungs work fine um but because it's yeah because we're we get the the respiratory support then yeah it's difficult <laughs> it's difficult along the same lines you know we're hearing about a lot of the science and the potential for treatment and novel ways of treatment delivery and gene-based treatments, which again, it, it is, I think it's obviously fascinating, but gives us some hope that there's a way forward. You know, part of what we think about when we're modeling diseases and we're trying to sort of think about treatments is what, what symptoms do we want to treat? Uh, and I think as a neurologist, I'll sort of speak for my ilk, we, we tend to focus on the seizures as a primary measurable outcome. And we also tend to focus on development, although it's, you know, it takes a long time to show demand, you know, sustained improvement in development, but it, it can be done. Be besides from those sorts of symptoms, what are the most important things that are affecting your children and your family day to day that you'd want us to keep in mind as a field as we're 
looking at animal models and we're looking at clinical trials for, for children like yours. So for me, from Evan's perspective, it's, um, I think this whole like area of autonomic disorders, which um, we, I listened to the, the session with Keith Kaufman and I think he's got one tomorrow. I mean, Evan stops breathing every five minutes of every day when he's awake, like that for us affects absolutely his quality of life and everything that he does. So until we get that sorted and every night he has these like episodes where his whole face goes red, his whole ear goes red, his whole side of the body, his legs go like alien legs every night. So for us, it's so frequent that that happens that you can't, it's difficult to think about him, you know, improving his communication until he can breathe without kind of hindrance and constantly hyperventilating to kind of recover. Um, so yeah, for us, it would be that as, and then for my quality of life, it would be sorting out its gastric problems because dealing with just horrendous like diarrhea all the time is horrendous. So, <laughs> so for me, it would be that, but he probably doesn't mind about that. So. But I think, yeah, the autonomic areas for, for Evan, that's obviously for Evan. Kat, how about for you all? Um, so she does not have seizures as far as we know. She had a um, overnight that was negative. She does have a lot of repetitive behaviors. And, and so, so, you know, at one point we wondered um, a lot of what Allison was saying about the rocking and the head banging, you know, I'm mm -hmm. definitely familiar with that. Um, she doesn't bite, but she does, she does kind of scratch her nails against everything. So, you know, she scratch her, scratch herself a little bit sometimes. Um, I would say um, the tone, the low tone would really be helpful to, to figure out what's going on. Why is it so low and, and how can we do some, something about it other than just PT? Um, because, you know, as, as one of her neurologists says, I, I can take away tone, but I can't give you it. And uh, it would be nice if, if, if they could give it um, because she's been so close to sitting for a year. It's just tantalizingly close for, for you know, I, yeah, since at least October, she's been able to sit unsupported, even not propped up, unsupported for a minute sometimes, but no more. Um, and um, the awareness, um, she just, it's gotten a little better, but she just really seems to be in her own world. And I don't know how you're supposed to teach someone something if they're in their own world. Um, kind of like autism, but a little bit more than that. Um, one of the issues with sitting is that she just doesn't, I don't think she understands that, hey, when I move my arm, I'm going to fall down now. I, I don't think she understands that part. Even, you know, I think physically she could probably sit um, for a little bit longer than she does. So, so yeah, the tone and um, the tone and the repetitive behaviors um, and the GI for us as well. Um, the reflux is more of a, a problem than the um, than the constipation. Um, the reflux can be a problem because she'll cough with fluids sometimes. So we actually have to get a, uh, um, a swallow study done. Um, so yeah, it, it hit home when she was talking about the G tube. You know, we, we don't, uh, she's only ever had an NG tube when she had the heart stuff. And you know, cause, cause when you have the heart problems you just can't, you can't eat, you're too tired to eat. But um, I definitely know about, you definitely want your kid to eat. and and not have to be on a tube. And, you know, I, I actually asked last week when they ordered the small study, I said, well, if she fails, this does that mean she's on a G-tube for life? And they said, no, doesn't necessarily mean that, but, you know, it tells you where my fears are. Yeah. It, for us, a G, I think there's a real fear with G-tubes. And for us, it just gave us that security that we always knew that we could get the right nutrition in him to give him, because as he's got older, he's, um, you know structurally gets they they grow they get bigger they get stronger naturally and but having the g-tube just gave us that security that we could always get stuff in so doggedly you can give them food all the time but if they can't eat or they don't want to eat or they're poorly or whatever you know that you can always get that nutrition in i think that's helped bolster his um like physical physicality so that he is stronger so that he um can now I mean he doesn't walk independently but he can stand and walk and he can't get up on his own or anything like that he hasn't got the cognitive understanding to kind of get up on his own but if he's up he can step with support and stuff and I think I think there's a real fear with the G2 but um for us it was the best thing we ever did for him I think I think it was um it just gave us that security um 
and yeah, it meant that he he's managed to still eat three meals a day every day. Um, but I know that it's different for different people, so I'm not saying it's it's all the same, obviously. Yeah, I think but it's really was, helpful to hear you yeah. talk about it, uh, just because it's it's a familiar familiar sort of sequence that you've you've both mentioned in terms of you know you consider these things you want to be able to to feed them, but you also you're balancing those nutritional requirements, safety of of swallowing and all those things, but. I think it, it it's highlights for me one of the non non neurological parts. It's all related to the neurology of swallowing and all those things, but you know, not a not a seizure, not a developmental um, conversations that you know, as neurologists, we have to be able to have and to partner with the gastroenterologists and so on because it really is you know it's a group conversation, and I think the the hardest thing to do sometimes is to get the general pediatrician and the GI people and the neurology people all together with the family. But sometimes you have to do that and have a conversation to say, look, we're not saying all feeds. We're not saying forever. You know, yeah. you know, we're not saying it's it's not a black and white thing, but right now in this moment, in this month, in this year, how do we weigh those? And in, in many ways, it's no different than the decisions you make about, do we start a new medicine or not? You know, what are the risks? What are the benefits? So I think you've, you've highlighted both of you those those issues uh, around the G tube, which you could kind of zoom out and extrapolate to uh, some of the decisions that I, I hope you'll have to make about future treatment. So my next question to each of you is, you know, what, what are you what are you thinking um, about these exciting scientific treatments that are maybe coming down the pike? And are you are you eager? Are you not eager? Are you wanting to be? In the front of the pack or you want to wait and see how it goes um, and this is you don't have to answer it if you don't want but it's something that i i'm talking to my patients a lot about and i, I i'm always wanting to know how, how each individual family feels um so i think so we've tried a lot of not experimental but drugs that aren't um you know that are licensed for use in children so in the nhs i get, i don't know if it's different in the states um they can't give drugs that aren't licensed for children. So I guess that would be the defining factor, but they will use drugs that are off license for a particular condition, you know? So we've tried a lot of experimental things for Evan's um, apnea and hyperventilation to try and get these things to get it under control. And we've been through kind of like three drugs now, which have made absolutely no difference. And have generally just stonked him out as a, just made him a bit of a zombie. Um, which uh, was not great because that's not that's not my I, my interpretation of improving grin is by then turning them into a completely different child like the last one he was on he just he never smiled he never grinned you know he never giggled you couldn't get any kind of like reaction out of him he was just like so flat which was great because you didn't get the ups and downs but then you never got the ups so and the, you know everybody the downs are just part of having a child, aren't they? But um, I think, yeah, I we would be willing to try them definitely if we could get them on the NHS. I think there'll be different hoops to jump through, I guess, in the UK um, for uh, to get things on the NHS. But we are lucky in that one of our consultants is quite keen to try different things because he like every time we go in, he's just like, oh, particularly about his breathing, he's like, I don't, we know, we, we really don't know what we're doing. So we're just pick, pulling ideas out of the sky to see if we can improve things. So yeah, we're willing to try stuff, but yeah, and that goes with a caveat of like safety and not wanting to be a, like not, you know, I don't know if I'll be the first one in there, but I don't know, we'll see. Sorry, not very helpful. <laughs> no, I think very helpful. I think really helpful. So, um, so Abby's actually going to most likely start Elserin fairly soon. Um, and I guess she'll be the first GRIA kid to try it and not N um, um, because it's her, you know, it's her AMPA receptors that are affected, not the NMDA, but they said something about they're tied together. So helping the NMDA may help the AMPA if I understand it right. Um, I did want to quickly loop back and and add that um, another big issue for her is her hand usage. Um, we really thought that she had RET for a while. 
Um, you know, that's, that's what I was sure it was going to come back as. Um, and it was so powerful for me when I saw on the report that one of the common symptoms is rep like hand movements because that's, that's her. She, she just looks at her hands all day. Um, I mean, she's a little bit better at it now, but that was a big problem. Um, and when you were talking about having a home, um, the whole GI stuff, right now, the new doctor at Kennedy Krieger is actually ordering GI studies. The, she's ordering the small study. She's referring us to a GI about the constipation and the reflux. And I think that's a godsend because before it was the regular pediatrician that would do that. And the problem with that is, is that the regular pediatrician doesn't know a darn thing about GRIA 2. And so the, the doctor at Kennedy Krieger is willing to be her general pediatrician and work on the GRIA stuff. And it's, it's been really helpful having the coordination that way. Um, but, but anyway, as far as the l um, she has to get, um, they wanted to complete the weaning of that heart drug first. Um, so that's another week or two. And then they're gonna get um, uh, overnight EEG, just we have a baseline so that we, you know, can kind of know if the L-serin causes seizures or not, because she doesn't have them now, as far as we know. Um, and she may get another MRI. She had a fast MRI when she was like 10 months old. She's never had a complete MRI yet. Um, and they did a bunch of lab work, all of which was normal, except for the um, calcium and the B12. They, they you know, we're, basically we're in the process of getting the baselines ready so that, that we can start. Great. Well, in our, our last couple of minutes, um, I wondered if you'd each just say something to the group, but particularly to the, the broader group of not only families, but also researchers who are you know, wanting to do good science uh, in service of, of your kids and your families. You know, what, what is the thing that gives you the most hope? I think it's just for me is to see how far things have come in a in a really quick space of time. You know, it's only kind of four years ago, three years ago that Evan got his diagnosis. And that was kind of like just as the first results were coming out about finding out what it was. And it's moved so quickly to have such progress. And now there's such incredible minds working on it. I don't understand half of what was said in the previous session, if like a tenth of what was said in the previous session, but clearly there's some amazing people working on it. So just keep working on it like really hard because we really need it <laughs> as parents. We're often like losing our minds. So um, even though there's a really small number of kids, those kids are really important and they um, they give the best cuddles and they have the best smiles. Um, I think bigger, like better than any kid. So I think That's just great. keep working hard. Thank you for everything that you do. That's great, Alison. How about Kat? I'll give you the last word. You mentioned you had hope, and you give us a line or two about what what is uh, what's most hopeful for you. Um, it, it was so reassuring to know that hey, we already have drugs that that modify AMPA receptors and NMPA receptors, and then there's the PAMs and something that I don't know all those words, but they exist and and it was like hey there's already stuff that that may exist and that that was just amazing because i you know it just gives me hope to know that hey if, if the stuff is mostly already here and we just have to see what works um that's what gives me hope great well thank you both so much and kate thank you for for giving uh me the time to chat with these wonderful parents and uh to hear their stories and i'll turn it back to you uh, th and thank you for for moderating. What a great way uh, to to end the morning with those um, those words from Allison and Kat, and and to hear about uh, Abby and Evan. So thank thank you very much for sharing. Um, I knew that the the morning was going to be good, but I was just so I, I don't know it, it was beyond my expectations. And you know some of the things we heard, um, it, it's just exciting that Grin Therapeutics is expanding beyond just Grin One and looking to go to clinical trial for, uh, or beyond GRIN 2B, we're looking to go to clinical trial for GRIN 1 and GRIN 2A uh, as well. And, and I'm actually, you know, I know, I know there was all kinds of caveats about how preliminary the data is and we should take it all um, that way, but the early results out of the Ramsey lab are um, shocking and <laughs> exciting to me if, if they turn out to be accurate. I, I think those are better results than people who have done this um, in other 
neurodevelopmental diseases have seen. So we'll uh, we'll we'll see if if the fuller uh, once there's a bigger sample that that's statistically meaningful if that that continues. But it's definitely promising. So um, yeah, it's been a, a great morning. We're taking a break now for half an hour, but um, this is your opportunity to let me just try to pull up my slides again. Yeah, so, so this is the opportunity to meet with some of the sponsors. So uh, I believe that three of our sponsors, yeah, three of our sponsors have set up booths. Um, and I believe that they'll be there during this half hour break. So um, Grin Therapeutics, who you heard from um, earlier and is a sponsor of the conference, will be there. Uh, Sage Therapeutics, which is um, another biotech developing uh, PAMs and NAMs or, or, or drugs um, that target the, uh, the ion receptors, and Variant, which is a, a new startup launched by uh, one of the University of Toronto researchers that we work with, Catherine Ensign, um, and that is a, an app for, for tracking and sort of crowdsourcing um, medicine that, that works or doesn't. So you can um, visit any of those booths to learn more and, and meet with them. And then um, when we're back at 1.30, we have, um, you have a choice of, of sessions. Um, so there's there's two sessions to choose from at each time and uh, look forward to seeing you there.